In this lesson, let's talk about what is GraphQL and how it differs from REST APIs. GraphQL basically contains two things. As the name suggests, it's a query language for your APIs that lets you describe what data you have and what you can do with the data. But it also needs a runtime that can take a query written in this query language and fulfill the query with your existing data. So every GraphQL API has a schema that defines what query and the mutation operations it supports. Queries are for reading data and mutations for updating them. A client would send a query or mutation to a GraphQL server who would then validate the request against the schema and process the request. There are GraphQL server implementations for just about every language, but for this course, we're going to use AppSync, which is a managed AWS service that fulfills the role of a GraphQL server. The schema is the contract between the client and the server, and it's not just a piece of documentation that's generated from the server side implementation. Like many Swagger or Open API specs, a GraphQL schema, on the other hand, doesn't document the operations a GraphQL API supports, it defines them and is binding. And every GraphQL schema starts with the schema definition, which defines the two top level types, query and mutation, which we need to define in our schema. The query type is where we define the read operations that we're going to support. For example, here we say we will support a get profile query that takes in an ID argument and returns a profile. In this case, the capital case ID is the name of a built-in type used to represent a unique ID. And the explanation mark means the argument is a required argument. I've always found it a bit weird that the explanation mark comes after the type and not the argument name, but it is how it is. This get profile operation returns the profile, which is a type that we need to define in our schema. And we can do it like this and specify what fields are available on a profile. Again, the explanation marks means they are required fields and are not nullable. We can also add a mutation type where we will define all the update operations we are going to support. And here we have a create profile mutation that takes in a first name and the last name and returns a new profile object. Again, referencing the profile type that we defined above. So when the client sends in a query or mutation request to the GraphQL server, the server is going to validate the request against the schema. The client can't ask for fields that don't exist on the schema, and the argument is sent has to be of the right type that matches what it says on the schema, and so on and so forth. And then the GraphQL server is going to map each type of field to a resolver who is responsible for fulfilling the request and uh, fetch data from different data sources, such as DynamoDB, RDS, or Elasticsearch. So whereas with REST APIs, uh, you make HTTP requests to a URL like this, where the path follows some hierarchical structure and uh, leads you to the data you're looking for, and typically returns data in JSON. In this example, I want the user profile for user ID 1234, and the API takes the user ID from the path as my argument. With GraphQL, there is only one entry point for all requests, and the convention is to use HTTP POST and pass the request argument as the body. Another important difference is that, as part of my request, I have to specify what fields from the profile that I want in the response. And since I've only asked for first name and the last name here, those are the only fields that are returned by the GraphQL server. The same works for nested fields and arrays as well. Imagine if there is a friends array on the profile, and I can say for each of the friends, what fields do I want in the response? Don't worry if this all seems a bit abstract at the moment. We will have plenty of time to dive into GraphQL schemas in the course. So let's walk through a real world example. Perhaps this is going to help crystallize things. Imagine you are building a social network app for people to do sports together. And as part of the app, you have a profile screen where you have to show your name and location, a profile image, and some background image as well. And a list of sports that you do and how good you think you are at each sport.
And you also need to show a list of the activities that you've organized so that other people can join, like a basketball match or jogging in the park. And for each activity, you need to show when and where it's happening and how many people are going to take part and so on. With a REST API, you will probably start by getting this user's profile, right? But notice that the user endpoint returns a lot of data that we don't actually need to display in the UI. This problem is known as overfetching, where we have to fetch data that we don't need, which wastes valuable bandwidth and the CPU cycles on both the client and the server. It also doesn't return all the data that we need for the UI, so we end up having to make further requests to other endpoints to get the details on each sport, as well as to get a list of activities for this user. This adds additional round trip between the client and the server, and it's not always possible to do this in parallel, which adds delay to how quickly we can render the UI and hurt our user experience. This is known as the underfetching and the N plus one requests problem, which is another source for efficiency and waste. To mitigate some of these problems, a common pattern emerged called BFFs or backends for frontends, where frontend teams would create dedicated APIs for just the UI page they're working on. And this backend for frontend would act as proxy to the other APIs to help reduce the number of round trips between the client and the server and to give the frontend teams more control over what data are returned to mitigate some of the impacts of overfetching and underfetching. But you do end up creating a lot of BFFs, which is a maintenance headache. And you also end up doing a lot of duplicated work, potentially duplicating code between different BFFs, as well as duplicating logic between the BFF and the actual backend APIs. And with GraphQL, there's essentially no need for writing bespoke BFFs every time you need to work on a new UI page. Since the client have a lot more expressive power to ask for whatever data they need and only the data they need. So to implement the same UI using GraphQL, I can ask for all the data I need for this single page. With just one GraphQL request where as an authenticated user, I ask for my profile and specify that in the response. I want my ID, first name, last name, gender, and so on. And the GraphQL server will fetch this from a profile table in DynamoDB. And for each of my sports, I need the display name field as well as the image URL. But wait, the list of sports in the profile only contains the ID for the sport because we want to be able to change the display name and image URL for the sports easily. So we don't want to bake them into every user's profile. So now we're going to need to get the display name and image URL from the sports table, kind of like a join in relational databases where we join by these two fields and then select the display name and the image URL in the response. Well, GraphQL handles that for us and uh, maps those fields for individual sports to a separate resolver and uh, fetch them from the sport table in DynamoDB. So we're good here. There's no need for the client to send two separate requests, saving us those additional round trips, which would have been necessary with REST. And for my activities, uh, since I can have many, many activities, these are actually stored in a separate table away from my profile but each activity has a user ID, so I can find my activities by looking up my user ID. We can associate this activities field on the profile type to another resolver, which will fetch the activities from the activity table using a DynamDB query. And we can further expand any nested objects in the requests. For example, for the first name and the profile image of other users who have asked to join my basketball match which will also be coming from the profile table. And as you can see, this is all very flexible. The client can basically ask for any information they need in a single query. And it solves the problems of overfetching and underfetching, and the client can ask for just the data it needs, nothing more, nothing less. And the GraphQL schema itself is a strongly typed contract between the client and the server, which also doubles as both request and response validation. The client can't ask for data that is not exposed in the schema, nor can the server return any data that's not in the schema neither, making it much harder for attackers to steal data from our systems that we don't intend to return. And it solves one of the pain points of using NoSQL databases like DynamDB, where there are no joins and you typically have to perform joins in your application code. Here, GraphQL and AppSync takes care of that for you as well.
And with all things considered, GraphQL makes it much easier for you to build data-driven applications and enable front-end teams to rapidly iterate on the product and user experience. And it has become my default choice for building new applications. And I'm sure by the end of this course, you will feel the same too.